ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you especially for coming out on such a, a, an evening with polluted atmosphere as we, as we have. Uh, I know we're getting used to it, but um, I, I appreciate you coming. Thank you very much. Um, this evening, uh, I want to introduce uh, the most loved site in Singapore to you all. I'm sure you've all been there. Um, but more importantly, I want to explain why it merits uh, being a UNESCO site. And that's the, really the main purpose of the, this, uh, this evening's talk. Um, the summary of what I'm going to say is up there on the screen. Um, but let's get going. Uh, first of all, the Singapore Botanic Gardens was inscribed as a cultural landscape. A cultural landscape is something which you might say um, is a mixture of nature and the works of man. And that's essentially what a garden is in many ways. But more importantly, the Singapore Botanic Gardens is perhaps the best preserved example of a colonial botanic garden. And the image you see on the screen right now is of the Palm House at Kew Gardens. Kew Gardens was the mothership at the center of more than 100 British colonial gardens um, by the end of Queen Victoria's reign. And as a colonial botanic garden, it has to stand on its own feet and be comparable with others. Perhaps the finest colonial botanic garden in the tropics was, at least at one time, this garden, Calcutta. Um, but sadly, over the last 100 years, that fine garden has lost quite a lot of its character and a, a lot of its original purpose. Whereas the Singapore Botanic Gardens has remained in many senses true to its original purpose and its fabric and design has remained intact. And these are important considerations for the UNESCO inscription because UNESCO expects um, integrity, so the, the place is, is, is intact, and authenticity, in other words, it's the real thing. It's not something we've just made an imitation of what was there before. This is the earliest photograph we have of the Botanic Gardens, taken in March 1871, on the occasion of the visit of the young King Chudalongkorn from Siam, or Thailand as we know it today. He was 18 years old. And in the background, you can see some temporary structures which were erected for the annual flower show. And flower shows are one of the abiding uh, parts of Singapore Botanic Gardens history. Today, we have the Singapore Garden Festival. The last edition ran last year at Gardens by the Bay, and there will be another one uh, next year. Uh, so flower shows were an important part. And in the early years of the Botanic Gardens, they were actually the fundraiser that kept the gardens going before the gardens became a government institution. Because between um, 1859 and the close of 1874, the gardens were run by an agricultural agri society. And certainly in this picture, many of its members um, can be seen. And I suppose the most remarkable thing about this picture has nothing to do with the landscape or the plants um, or the garden itself, but the amount of clothing that the participants are wearing. You know, uh, I might be persuaded that today's Singapore um, is a few degrees warmer due to the you know, uh, city heat island effect than it was in 1871. But surely um, it was not so cool that they needed to have four or five layers of clothing on. Um, it must have been extremely unpleasant to be dressed in those days. Well, a key part um, of the garden's history is its landscape. And its landscape was laid out by this man, Lawrence Niven. And as an aside, I might tell you that uh, a week ago today, a young man, 22 years old, knocked on my office door without any warning and announced that he was the great, great, great grandson of Lawrence Niven and then promptly produced a family tree to prove it. Um, I was very impressed with him. He had a beard, um, even, even as impressive um, as this man's beard, uh, except not quite so grey, being a 22-year-old. Um, but more remarkable than that, nine weeks earlier, two ladies, sisters, who could prove that they were the great-great-granddaughters of Lawrence Niven, had turned up at the gardens and were given a tour. 
And when we interrogated the young man last week, we discovered that he didn't know about them and they didn't know about him. And so I've now connected these two erstwhile separated parts of this important family. Um, Niven grew up in Scotland. He was born in 1826. His father was uh, the head gardener of one of the grand Scottish garden estates. He did an apprenticeship um, on another estate. And the style of gardening and the style of landscape that he would have known at that time is what we today call the English landscape movement. And this is a style where the designer does not impose the design on the landscape, rather the existing assets of the landscape suggest a naturalistic design to the designer. In other words, the designer works with what he's got and tries to improve on nature. And if you look at the left-hand map, um, which shows the garden as it was in 1866, you can detect that there's very little formality. There is no symmetry. Um, the, the, the path layout is, is rather irregular and curving. There are very few straight lines. And this is typical of the English landscape movement. And what makes the Singapore Botanic Garden so unusual is that all other gardens I know that have this landscape design are in the temperate regions using temperate plants. These are gardens much closer to the poles than they are to the equator. But here in Singapore, so close to the equator, we have a, an English landscape movement style garden made with tropical plants. That makes it really unique. And I think that was one of the factors that appealed to the World Heritage Committee. One of the other remarkable things that the garden has is six hectares of virgin rainforest. I think Singapore can probably claim to be the only major city in the world that has um, a pristine, untouched, virtually untouched primary rainforest inside um, the city. Um, that is truly remarkable. Of course, this rainforest is really under threat because the, all, the, all the surrounding um, environment is totally changed and so it is drying out somewhat and we actually have to water, water this rainforest to keep it going. It sounds stupid, I know, but we do. Um, it's a fantastic educational tool because if you are a Singaporean um, uh, today, you, you will not have much opportunity to see what the environment in this island looked like 150 years ago. This, this wonderful uh, vegetable asset enables you to see that. <clears throat> and you can walk through it on a boardwalk. We have uh, quite a, a good uh, photographic archive of the, of the Botanic Gardens um, from 1877. In that year, uh, a photographer came and made quite a number of pictures. And without this, we would have little idea of what the gardens looked like um, in the early years. On the left, you see the bandstand. Now, what most of you may know as the bandstand today is a little gazebo, a very beautiful octagonal gazebo, which is in the center of the bandstand. But the bandstand, in actual fact, was the leveled off top of the highest hill on the site from 1859, where military bands used to march up and down after dark and play music to the light of the moon, of the moon from 1861. Extremely romantic. Um, and for over 100 years, that's how the music was played. And there are many um, anecdotal accounts of uh, people in Singapore before the turn for the beginning of the 20th century, going to the gardens to listen to mostly military music. And extraordinarily, during the Second World War, when the Japanese were in charge, they decided this tradition should be continued. So their military bands even played in the garden. So there is a continuous um, history of music from 1861 until the present day, when, of course, today we do it on a much grander scale. The picture uh, in the top right... Um, with the gentleman in white in the center, is the garden staff in 1877. And the man in the center is James Merton, whose portrait you see lower down. Um, he's an interesting character because he was the first botanically qualified person to be appointed. Lawrence Niven um, went on leave um, in 1875, and while on leave, he died. And in a way, I mean, it was unfortunate that he died, but. Uh, it saved a rather awkward situation whereby the government, having taken over the gardens um, in that year, appointed a botanically qualified young man from Kew Gardens to be 
uh, Niven's superior. Niven was nearly 50, and that young man was only 22 when appointed. And uh, it is a rather surprising appointment. His appointment was recommended by Sir Joseph Hooker, the director of Kew, who was the most powerful man botanically in the world at that time. And um, he must have been considered very good for Hooker to appoint uh, a guy so young. But being young, he was a little inexperienced, and certainly in the ma matter of managing people and things, he was a little inexperienced. His botany may have been good, but people management was not one of his strong points. And one of the difficulties in this time was that your staff, your garden staff, didn't even speak the language that you spoke. You had to deal with them through um, their foreman, who hopefully spoke enough English to be able to act as an interpreter of your commands. And we know from the Straits Times on the 14th of September 1877 that something very nasty had happened the day before. And in fact, this picture must have been taken some time before um, that date, because it certainly could not have been taken afterwards. The week before the 13th of September, we are told that the staff, uh, the foreman of the staff, the man with the hat um, to, the, to the left of um, Merton, as we see in this picture, or rather to Merton's right, um, had come demanding the weekly wage for the Javanese. The Javanese workers were the ones on the left-hand side of the picture. And Merton refused to pay on the basis that he believed these guys had been stealing possessions from his office. And he said, well, I'm not going to pay now, but if my possessions are returned, I will consider paying next week. So a, a week later on the 13th um, of September, uh, the foreman comes back and demands the wages, knowing that some of these belongings had been returned. But of course, they couldn't all be returned with some of them being converted into cash. But Merton rather naively insisted that they all had to be returned before he was going to pay. At which point the foreman, realizing the hopelessness of the situation, swore at him. And not accepting this verbal rebuke, Merton, the younger man, slaps the foreman around the face, whereupon the foreman draws his stick and tries to whack the superintendent. But he catches the stick and breaks it, at which point the foreman really loses his temper and draws his parang and chases Merton across the gardens. Merton, being quick, fleet of foot, manages to escape and locks himself in the, in the superintendent's bungalow, Ber uh, Burkill Hall, as we call it today, and awaits further developments. He goes and finds his revolver, and sometime later, a posse of armed Javanese arrive at his house, demanding their wages. He opens the door, he fires warning shots over their heads. But I guess, you know, life was cheap in those days. These guys didn't care whether they lived or died. They just wanted their money. Um, so he then locks the door again, and eventually his deputy persuades them to disperse. And we're told by the paper that the following day, the ringleader, presumably the foreman, is arrested for insurrection. And I'm very pleased to tell you that today, managing staff in the Botanic Gardens is a lot easier than it was in 1877. Here is another view from that year, um, looking from roughly where the Ministry of Foreign Affairs building is situated today, so looking from the south northwards into the garden. Um, running along sort of the middle of the picture, very faintly, you can see Holland Road. It was just a dirt track in those days. Um, and you can also see that most of the trees in the gardens are very small. They, had, they were newly planted. They hadn't grown up to be the forest which you see today. On the left, you can see uh, what we now call Swan Lake. And in the distance behind the lake, you can see the superintendent's house, what we call Burkill Hall. And to the right of the picture, some of the great emergent trees of the rainforest. But what's important about this picture is it shows that the paths that were there at that time are the same as the paths in their layout today. And that's very important in terms of authenticity. Here is a modern picture of Swan Lake. This is the earliest ornamental water body in Singapore. Um, excavated in 1866 from a freshwater swamp by, by Niven, and, and one of the most um, popular places in the gardens. And here we see now the bandstand with the 1930 gazebo erected on it, with a band playing in 1956, the year of my birth, and people sitting on the grass um, around the gazebo listening to the music. 
um, part of the continuing tradition. And the most important building on the site it actually is not that gazebo, although it may be the most iconic. It's this one. This is Birkhill Hall. And as you see in this picture, and if you go there and see it today, it is painted in black and white, but incorrectly. Until around 1960, it was in white only. It was essentially whitewashed. And because it's been painted in black and white in error, people have interpreted it as one of those rather frequent old black and white bungalows that you find in Singapore. But this is no black and white bungalow. This is the last surviving Anglo-Malay plantation style house. And if you walked along Orchard Road in the 1840s and 50s, and you looked at the hills, some of which have gone actually, on either side of Orchard Road, you would have seen buildings like this as the plantation owners' residences in the middle of their nutmeg plantations. Orchard Road is named for the nutmeg orchards that occupied the hills on either side until about 1860, and these were the style buildings. Um, so this is a very, very precious building. It may be the only survivor of its kind, at least in an unaltered state, anywhere in the world. Um, so we have something very special. Um, it was occupied by the superintendents and directors of the gardens until 1969, and nowadays it's the centerpiece of the National Orchid Garden. So early next year, it will be repainted in white, and that's how I hope it will remain. Here's a view of the gardens looking across from the director's house, um, to the rainforest across Palm Valley. Um, some of the trees you can see in the background are still there today. These are trees that lived for hundreds of years. And here's the main gate. Um, it looked like this from about 1886. It was opened in 1864. The, the, the modern posts are um, at the same spacing of the originals, but they're not in exactly the same place because... Um, as in all things in Singapore, there have been developments and slight movements, and the whole thing has moved slightly east. Interestingly, you could drive into the gardens until 1968. Um, there are many early photographs of grand people of Singapore in their Rolls Royces and other grand cars uh, driving through the gardens. I'm glad to say that today we don't allow traffic anymore. Now, um, the map on the right uh, signals a very important moment in the garden's history because from 1879 the government who had taken over a few years before was petitioned for more land. Merton had filled up the existing land and wanted more land to test economic crops. Two years earlier in 1877 he had received 22 rubber trees, small seedlings from Kew Gardens. They come from Brazil via Kew. And he wanted to plant these trees and other plants of economic potential um, in, a, in an area where he could experiment with them away from the public view, essentially an experimental garden. And he was given um, 41 hectares of land in, in 1879. And by 1918, when this map was drawn up, you could see how it had been planted up. And for those who can't read the small writing, there are many plots that say rubber, um, there's sago, coffee, um, plantains, pineapples, root crops, and significantly in the lower left-hand side, written rather indistinctly, gutta. What is gutta? It is the plant that literally changed the world. Maybe you could argue as significant, possibly more significant than what came later, the, the rubber boom. Gutta enabled the world's first intercontinental communications. In the 1850s, if you were in Singapore and you wanted to communicate with your family who might be in London or Paris or New York, you put a letter on board sailing ship. Two months later, it would arrive, and then, if you were lucky, the person it was addressed to would reply to you, and two months after that, you'd get a reply. Meanwhile, they might have died, but you wouldn't know. Then in the 1860s, it was discovered you could put electronic signals through copper cable. That was all very well, but the trouble is there was no materials like we have today to insulate that copper cable. So if you wanted to put that cable under the ocean, it, it, you needed an insulator. And the only material they found was gutta, which was the latex of a tree, which we 
today botanically called palaquium, of which there are a number of species in this region, and mostly they contain this latex. And what was happening from the 1860s until the 1890s, people were going into the forest and cutting these trees. They were basically sacrificing the trees. They weren't harvesting the latex in a sustainable way. They were harvesting in a way which killed the tree, and the trees were getting rarer and rarer. And in the 1890s, the colonial governor, recognizing the crisis that was going to hit um, not only the island of Singapore, but the region in terms of being able to communicate with the rest of the world, suggested to Ridley, the then director, that he should go and collect seeds of the last few of these trees and cultivate them in the botanic garden in order that they would not go extinct. And we have two remaining Guta trees, they're heritage trees today in the botanic garden, dating from 1897 roughly in the position where that, 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 that name is marked on the map. And they are perhaps the world's first example of ex situ conservation involving plants. The zoos, of course, have been conserving animals for much longer than we plant lovers have, but this is a very, very early example indeed. Here is the man himself uh, with his assistant. Um, both he and his assistant live to be over 100 years old. So if you want to be long-lived, work in botanic gardens. Why do you think I'm here? Uh, Ridley is standing beside one of the now mature rubber trees and demonstrating um, his technique for extracting the latex from the tree. Now, it's important to understand that the harvesting of rubber latex did not begin in Singapore. It started in the Amazon with using native stands of trees with the, the local people, the seringueros as they're called, cutting the trees for latex. But they cut the trees very badly, and the trees died. But there were always more trees. However, the production was quite limited. And once um, Henry Ford invented the, uh, the production line for motor cars and needed lots of rubber for rubber tires, um, and many other uses for rubber, I might add, um, a demand for rubber went up. And Ridley recognized that if you could cultivate rubber away from its native habitats, where it will be free from all the pests and diseases which rubber in Brazil suffers from, you could make a mint of money. But he had to convince the planters that they should change from the existing crops which were making money, like coffee, um, tapioca, and so on, and plant something new which would not yield them any revenue for at least seven years. And if at the beginning of the seven year, at the end of the seven year period, they cut the trees too violently, they would kill the trees, and so their investment would be worth nothing. So he developed a technique for very, very gently um, incising the bark so the latex could be made to run and collected, and he could do that every day without the tree suffering. And this was his, his early technique on the bigger trees. Nowadays, we, we have a single spiral cut, which does the same job. He also realized that if these trees were going to be cultivated effectively, you had to have the right ground. And he, he noted that sloping ground was much better than flat ground because the tree does not like to be too wet. He also noted that if you wanted to get the most latex, it was no good cutting the tree in the afternoon. You had to go out before dawn and cut the tree. And then, having got the latex, it's a living substance. It's rather like milk. If you don't treat it in some way, it goes rotten. It doesn't smell very nice anyway. And he found techniques of uh, preserving it so it could be transported to the factories in Europe and North America where it would be manufactured into goods. He was a scientist, but he was a very practically minded person. And it was his single-handed enthusiasm for rubber which really established the crop. And there was one other important world factor in this. Um, some of the land where rubber um, was, being, was, was to be grown had coffee on it. And the Brazilians, from where the rubber had come, and are still complaining today that the British stole it from them, we didn't, but they complained that way. And I have been on Brazilian television and had to defend that point. Um, but the Brazilians had acquired coffee via the Guianas from Ethiopia. And they discovered that coffee grew very well in Brazil, and it didn't suffer from any of the problems that coffee had in Southeast Asia. So the Brazilians started to produce coffee much more cheaply than the Southeast Asian planters could produce. So the, the bottom fell out of the coffee market just at the moment when rubber became an opportunity. And 
that worked very much in Ridley's favour, and it certainly helped um, the rubber boom get established. Ridley, however, wasn't just interested in things that might be economically significant. He also was very fond of orchids, um, as well as zoology. By the way, uh, Tim, Tim Barnard, who's in the audience um, this evening, is going to publish a book next year, um, which will tell the, the, the more, much more about Ridley and confirm what I heard was a rumor that Ridley had a pet tapir in the Botanic Gardens. Now, tapirs are extremely shy animals, but apparently this tapir would sleep outside his residence, and in the morning when he went to the office, would follow him, and then at some point go off and browse on the Botanic Gardens collections. I'm not sure as the present director I approve of that, by the way. Um, and then in the evening would follow him back home, and uh, he, he, so he had a pet tapir. Uh, Ridley liked animals as much as plants, but this orchid, which is now Singapore's national flower, was named by him in 1893. Um, this Agnes Joachim, an Armenian from Tangzhong Pagar, brought this plant from her garden and said to him, no, this is something different, I, I don't know what it is, what do you think it is? And he figured out that it must be a hybrid between two of the orchids that she was growing in her garden. It's still debated today, by the way, whether she created the hybrid or whether um, the birds and the bees created the hybrid, which I think is much more likely. Here's an image of the rubber plantation at the Botanic Gardens in around 1890. And what you can notice is that the trees have numbers and codes written on the trunks. That's because Ridley and those who followed him were testing each tree to see how much latex it gave. Believe it or not, rubber trees are very variable, just like we all vary as individuals. They individually vary in the amount of latex they produce. And what Ridley hoped, in fact, he was right, that if he harvested the seeds from the trees that gave the most latex, they would be the best ones for plantation agriculture. So eventually some of the trees were got rid of because they were very poor producers, and the very best ones were encouraged. Then, in the 1920s, disaster struck. The utility of the economic gardens was judged by the colonial government to have run its course, and a great chunk of the economic gardens was annexed for the construction of Singapore, Singapore's first college of tertiary education, Raffles College. Its successor today is the NUS Law Faculty, which is still adjacent to the Botanic Gardens. But surprisingly, all was not lost because this gentleman, Eric Holton, appeared as the new director. And although a botanical scientist of great ability, he started to focus on horticulture. And he took up a technique which had been developed in the United States but had never been really utilized to breed orchids using what we call um, in, vitro, in vitro culture. This is where you take the orchid seed and you raise it in laboratory conditions, in glass flasks, in sterile culture. And to do this, you have to boil up everyday foodstuffs like potatoes, pineapples, bananas, what you will, rather like we might eat. And you infuse the boiled up material um, in, a, in a, an extract from a marine alga called agar. And on top of that sterile material that you've carefully sterilized in an autoclave, you sow your orchid seeds and they will germinate and grow. Why? Why is this necessary? Because in nature, wild orchid species have to connect with a fungus in order for the seed to germinate. Orchid seeds are almost unique in that they have no food resource. Now, if, we, if we eat peas or beans, we're eating seeds, and they contain a food resource which we can benefit from. And that food resource is to enable the seed to germinate. But orchids have done it the cheap way. They only have an embryo. They have no food resource. The seeds are produced by the million in the hope that there is a small chance that they will meet the symbiotic fungus which relates to each orchid species, and it's mostly a different fungus for each species, that will enable the seed to germinate. And in return, the orchid plant subsequently provides a home for the fungus. However, when you create a new orchid hybrid, there is no fungus anyway which will operate for it. So you have to raise the hybrid in artificial conditions. And this is a picture from 1958 of the laboratory, which was on the upper floor of that building, which was actually Holton's office. 
Um, and I suspect what we see here is the colonial governor in the middle, because this is still a British colonial times, being shown the operation of raising orchid hybrids. Back two years earlier, be before that picture was taken, the first so-called VIP orchid was named in 1956 for Lady Anne Black, the colonial governor's wife. And that started a tradition which continues to this day, and we now have named around 220 VIP orchids for heads of state from around the world. In fact, I think 90 sovereign states have been covered to date. And this is probably the best marketing program that Singapore could have. And I don't say even the Singapore Botanic Gardens, Singapore. You know, as a foreign visitor, when you arrive at Changi Airport, the first plant you see is an orchid. And orchids are now permanently associated with Singapore as a nation, and quite rightly so. I'm now going to move on to some of the softer but equally important parts of the garden's history. You know, um, I I've given lectures like this on a number of occasions um, since I arrived four years ago, and I remember very poignantly at my first lecture three years ago at NUS to a quite a large audience. An elderly gentleman and an elderly lady got up at the end of the talk and started eulogizing about the Botanic Gardens. And I at first didn't really understand what they were saying. But what they were saying was they owed their existence to the Botanic Gardens because their parents or their grandparents or their great-grandparents had met there. They'd been introduced as part of arranged marriage. And the Botanic Gardens was the neutral and respectable territory where good families could introduce boy to girl. You might ask, why? Why the Botanic Gardens especially? But if you think about what Singapore was like, especially back in the 19th century, it wasn't the clean, well-ordered, crime-free place it is today. Um, it was, I was going to say noisy, it's still noisy actually. Um, it, was, it was rather unclean and rather non-crime-free. Uh, it was a place where, as a businessman, you did your commercial activities, but it wasn't a place where you would take your family for relaxation. And outside the city limits were the remains of forests with rumoured man-eating tigers and snakes, disease, um, unruly Chinese headmen. Uh, so you didn't take your family there either. Where did you take them? You took them to the Botanic Gardens. And the fact that this tree, the $5 tenbu su, as we call it, is on the reverse of the $5 bill, I think is symbolic of the significance of the Botanic Gardens as a social and civic space. Um, and you can see the picture in the lower left hand of a young man proposing to his future bride. We don't know, by the way, whether she accepted him, but let's suppose she did. Um, today, there may not be so much of this formal um, arranged marriage anymore, but if you go into the Botanic Garden on almost any afternoon when the haze is not too bad, um, you will see young couples in their wedding gear uh, having their wedding photographs taken. And I have to say as an aside, this really freaked me out when I arrived. Because coming from the Western Hemisphere, um, the bridegroom is not supposed to see um, his future wife um, until, in her wedding dress until the day of the wedding. And I saw all these young couples all dressed up in their, fi their wedding finery uh, being photographed. And I, I went to my deputy, who's a, um, a Singaporean Chinese, and I said, Alan... Um, don't take this wrong, uh, but are Singaporeans you know, rather uh, cold as families? Because I see all these newly married couples in the Botanic Garden, and they're having their photographs taken, but there's no member of their family with them. What, why not? He said, oh, no, 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 boss, they're, they're not married yet. I said, really? But they all dress up, you know. You know. They'll, they'll be married probably in six months' time. So I had to scratch my head a bit about that. Anyhow... Um, I mean, this, this Tembu Su tree is also indicative of, of other things. Um, and one of them is this, that in 1959, um, the late Mr. Lee Kuan Yew had newly been elected as prime minister, and he had some problems to deal with. Earlier in the 1950s, there had been racial tensions, even race riots. And I think he recognized that if he was going to bring the population of the island together, in the future as a nation, he had to get people to work together as a single nation. Um, and he invented a series of um, variety shows 
People's Variety concerts. There were more than 100 events, many of them in the Botanic Gardens. And this image, which comes from the UK National Archive, shows him uh, inaugurating the first such concert on the 2nd of August, 1959. And uh, he uttered these rather important words, which I think have a, a, a deeper meaning than they actually say. Uh, here under open skies, Malays, Chinese, Indians will, I hope, discover the materials for a national art and national culture. But I think what he was really doing is bringing these, this racial diversity of, of ethnic groups in Singapore together as a single nation. And I think he did that very successfully. And so I think it is no exaggeration to say that nation building for Singapore began in the Botanic Gardens. It may have had other places as well, but certainly the Botanic Gardens was an important venue. And those traditions of music and entertainment in the gardens are today, of course, done on a huge scale with a new stage in Palm Valley, the Shaw Symphony stage. Um, but we also do use the bandstand gazebo occasionally. And I'm reminded that um, two years ago, uh, in November and December uh, 2013, we decided to celebrate the heritage of this important area um, by having reenactments of some concerts that had taken place many, many years before by moonlight. The only problem was the moon was very uncooperative and refused to shine at the weekends when we wanted to have our, our concerts. It just wasn't, the timing of the moon just wasn't right. So one of my staff said, don't worry, boss, we, we've got a solution. We're going to put up a, a very bright light inside a helium balloon 40 meters above the bandstand, and it will look just like the moon. And I remember one weekend I was traveling along in a bus along Holland Road, and I saw, wow, the moon's very bright tonight. And I thought, no, actually, that's not the moon. That's our artificial moon. <laughs> Anyhow, the other uh, very important thing that the Botanic Gardens did, and it did this twice, um, most famously since the 1960s, is help in greening up the island of Singapore, and particularly the city of Singapore. The greening movement um, began in the Botanic Gardens of necessity because the Botanic Gardens had the plants and it also had the expertise. And very soon, the Botanic Gardens started a school of horticulture in 1972, which would train new generations of horticulturists to help green up the island. But this was the second time the island had been greened up because in the 1880s, the colonial governors realized that so much forest had been cut down there was no longer freely available timber for construction. There was no longer freely available firewood. And many of the other commodities that the forest gave were lacking. And so Cantley, who was the third superintendent of the Botanic Gardens, was tasked with setting up a forest department. So he had to manage the Botanic Gardens and practically all the forests on the island. And he set up nurseries to propagate en masse trees for planting not only in reforested areas, but also along streets. And in fact, it's recorded that he planted up Hong Lim Park with nearly 1,000 trees. If you go there today, I'm afraid there's rather few trees in Hong Lim Park. Never mind. Well, behind the scenes, there are many things you don't see as a regular visitor to the gardens. There's a huge collection of preserved plant specimens, nearly three quarters of a million, in fact, which have been obtained from the region of Southeast Asia um, since around 1875. These are the record of what used to grow here, or hopefully in some cases still grows here, and are hugely important for understanding what we have to manage. Included amongst those three quarters of a million are 8,000 specimens, and the number is growing as we discover more, that are the ultimate reference points for the scientific names by which we identify the plants. So if you give me a plant and ask me to identify it, I will express an opinion about that plant. I might say, I think it's so-and-so. But that's a subjective opinion. But these specimens are the objective evidence of what a particular scientific name represents. They are the ultimate reference points. And if they're lost, uh, they are lost. You, you will never be sure, absolutely sure, what that plant was. The, the, the guy who described the plant may have written a very nice description, but you know, the actual specimen is much more important. And these 8,000 types, as they're called, are kept in a special room where if the place catches fire, you better get out of the room quick because the room is protected with inert gas. The specimens will be all right, but you will not. Um, 
we have around 10,000 different kinds of plants growing in the gardens, and um, as of two weeks ago, 59 heritage trees. That's more than 25% of all the heritage trees recognized in Singapore. And I have to put my hand up and admit to being an insider trader on this particular point, because I sit on the heritage tree panel, but yet I'm allowed to propose trees from my garden for heritage status. And of course, I've done that liberally. Um, one of the most important functions of the botanic gardens is something which goes on outside the botanic gardens boundaries. That's the reintroduction of lost species of flora uh, into Singapore, into nature reserves, even, even along uh, main highways, and particularly orchids and gingers we're focusing on at the moment. So these are things which have been lost from the flora but we are bringing back from the botanic gardens collections. We're a very important organization for education, and that's important in terms of UNESCO because the E of UNESCO stands for education. So about 100,000 school children, and the number is growing, come to the gardens um, each year, whether on their own steam or as part of our um, organized educational programs. And I'm proud to say that we are the most visited botanic garden in the world. And I'm quite certain about that because we have a very accurate system of recording visitors. When you come into the gardens, you pass through an infrared beam, and when you leave the gardens, you pass through the beam again. And each, each of those counts, we divide by two, and then we know how many visits we've had each day. And last year, we had 4.4 million. And this year, um, as long as the haze doesn't last too long, we will head for 5 million. And there's no other garden in the world that has so many visitors. Um, I can now reveal something which I haven't been able to talk freely about until quite recently. Um, and rather bizarrely, the Botanic Gardens has a very small Chinese burial ground. It's a family burial area, um, but it has something of great significance in terms of Singapore's history because it has the oldest in situ Chinese burial in the island. There are perhaps older burials in Bukit Brown, but they weren't originally there. They've been moved from earlier burial sites. This is in its original position. And we've known about this uh, for quite a long time, but we've not been able to talk about it because as a botanic garden, perhaps understandably, we were not supposed to be a burial ground. And URA would have told me I had to move these graves, but I didn't want to move them because I saw them as part of the site's history. And so they are now within the World Heritage Boundary and they have to stay there because they are part of the World Heritage Assets, and URA accepts that. So this is the grave from 1842, and um, there is another much grander grave of husband and wife, and they are connected to the earlier grave, we think, because the daughter of these two became the second wife of the guy in the earlier grave. And if that's true, that means she was born shortly after the time Raffles arrived. And what is even more interesting, and this has little to do with the Botanic Gardens, in fact, as far as we know, this is an interracial marriage. The gentleman buried here is Chinese, but his wife is Indonesian. And this is a very early example of an interracial marriage. But if you think about how things were in Singapore in these early years, Singapore was full of working men. They had left their women folk and their families behind in China or wherever else they'd come from. And so there was a great shortage of women, a great shortage of women of the right kind, if you know what I mean. And this guy may not have been able to find a Chinese wife. He may have liked to have one, but he probably couldn't find one, so he married an Indonesian girl. So this is actually an important piece of Singapore's history, and I'm very pleased that we've been able to preserve it as part of the World Heritage Site. There's a third grave on this site. Um, we don't know much about it. We, it's lost its headstone. We suspect that whoever was buried there has been removed. Um, and we're trying to find out more about these graves. We know what the, the gravestones say, but they don't actually help us identify the family. And it may be that we have to go to the imperial records um, in, in China to find out more about this family. We know they were wealthy. Um, in fact, the, the occupants of, of this grave you see on the screen now uh, contributed to one of the Chinese temples here. Um, and uh, we know that they had titles, but what we don't know, they, they were like sir and lady, but what we don't know is whether they gave themselves those titles while remote from the Chinese emperor, or whether they bought the titles, because we know that titles were sold. If, if it's the latter case, we may be able to trace them. We have advertised in the newspaper, but no one has come forward as the living relatives of these people. 
Anyhow, um, this is a curious piece of the garden's history, and I would love to believe that one day we will find some link between the gardens and this family. It could be that uh, they were occupying the land, uh, which became the economic garden. Um, it, it could be that they have no connection at all. We really don't know. So very briefly now, to, to end this talk, I would like to just explain a little bit of the process by which we got inscribed. Um, I think I mentioned at the beginning that we are a cultural landscape. So it, it, it's, as quoted here, cultural properties that represent the combined works of nature and of man. Um, and to be uh, evaluated, actually UNESCO itself uh, may be the body uh, that's, that has the World Heritage Convention, but it has an expert body which, which is called ICOMOS. That's the International Committee on Monuments and Sites, which uh, gives a, 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 a sound opinion on whether the site should be considered. And to be considered as a cultural property, you have to fulfill at least one of six criteria. And uh, the Botanic Gardens actually fulfills two of those six criteria, number two and number four. And I've emboldened the key words in these definitions. Um, so, exhibit an important interchange of human values over a sp span of time or within a cultural area of the world on development in architecture or technology, monumental arts, town planning, or landscape design. And the second criterion, be an outstanding example of something, and the key thing in this case is the landscape. And just five of the things which fulfill those criteria the trialing and development of tea crops. You know, rubber and oil palm have totally transformed the economy of this region. The Botanic Gardens was certainly the originator of rubber and was a key player also in the oil palm industry. Understanding the biodiversity of this mega-rich region has been the job of the gardens over the last 140 years. And today we are helping train the scientists from developing nations in the region to understand that biodiversity. And of course, the green of Singapore, both in the 1880s and now more recently, in the, over the last five decades, has been a, a world-leading activity in that the leaders of many um, countries and their cities have come here to see how Singapore does it and to emulate it. Um, and it's the place where, as I said earlier, in a sense, Singapore's nationhood was built and where key civic events took place. Um, and uh, as I've said already, um, it's an, a unique example of the English landscape movement employed in the tropics. Well, uh, just very briefly, this was the trajectory from um, 2010. Uh, before I arrived in 2011, a consultant report was commissioned to look at sites around Singapore that might potentially be considered for World Heritage status. Were any of these sites really worthy? And a short list was drawn up. And in that short list, only the Singapore Botanic Gardens was considered to be a strong candidate. I believe, actually, there are other candidates, but we, we'll leave that for another talk. Um, then, uh, Singapore had to join the World Heritage Convention. And that was a rather reluctant decision, surprisingly, because there was a belief, um, I, be I think, in government, that another convention, which has to do with the trading of artifacts, was somehow linked with the World Heritage Convention. And the fear they had, well, an, an understandable fear, I have to say, is that if this convention on artifact trading was, had to be signed as well, the port of Singapore would cease to function because every consignment would have to be inspected to see if there were any historic artifacts. But eventually we managed to um, convince everybody that the two conventions were not linked and you could sign the World Heritage Convention without being expected to sign the other one. After that was done, the tentative list of properties actually there was only one property on the list, was submitted to UNESCO. And one year later, we were allowed to submit our first nomination, which of course was the Singapore Botanic Gardens. And that happened in January 2014. Um, in parallel with this, we had a big program of raising awareness about the Botanic Gardens case. And most importantly, inviting the powers that be, the people who would make the eventual decision, to come to the garden and see the qualities the garden had. Um, interestingly, ICOMOS, the expert body, is not allowed to visit the site. I think because UNESCO are afraid that we would bribe them with crates of whiskey and, and put pressure on them to inscribe us. So they make the assessment 
purely on the documentation that they're given. And so that documentation has to be good. If the documentation is, is, is not good, you have no hope of getting inscribed, however important your site is. Um, and then uh, in the final stages, we had to respond to queries from the expert body. We even had a Skype session which linked South Africa, Argentina, Singapore, and Paris in the depths of the night in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. That was great fun. Um, and who were the players? Well, of course, various organs of government, in, including the, uh, the, my own Ministry of National Development, uh, including the statutory boards such as uh, National Parks and URA, the Ministry of, of Culture, including its statutory board, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs played a very important part in uh, engaging with the 21 countries on the World Heritage Committee, um, especially our ambassador to UNESCO, Andrew Toe. Um, the Ministry of Education uh, is important because actually that's the ministry which deals directly with UNESCO, because UNESCO is much more than just the World Heritage Convention. Um, Singapore Tourist Board, and not least um, Singapore's president, Tony Tan. He, he lent his authority to a number of events um, which showed how, how serious Singapore was about the bid. And then there were all the um, other non-government players um, and very important stakeholders, and they're listed there. And um, from amongst the government and non-government stakeholders, we now have um, a, a committee of stakeholders who oversee the management plan which had to be submitted uh, with the bid, and that, that committee meets every six months. Um, so we, are now, we now have a bit more oversight than we had before. Um, I'm just going to emphasize what that acronym uh, stands for, especially the educational part, but scientific, yes, very scientific because the Botanic Gardens uh, is full of botanical scientists and does a lot of scientific work, and of course it's a very important cultural organization, as I hope you've seen. So um, part of my job over the last four years has been to ensure that when people come to the gardens, they do get some information on the garden's history. I think when I arrived four years ago, it was very hard to find any educational signs that explained the historic significance of the garden. And if you were a child in school in Singapore, you also would get very little of the history of the country before the 1950s. In um, just... Uh, nearly two years ago, we opened our Heritage Museum, and that was opened by the Prime Minister. Um, and our magazine, and there are some examples of it here, has been very much refocused to cater for um, heritage interests. And our, our UNESCO documents were put up on our web website so people could examine them, um, and they were very public documents. And uh, rather like this evening, I have given, I don't know how many lectures, trying to engage people on the heritage of the garden. And there's been a great deal of media coverage. I think more media coverage of Singapore's bid than I've seen in any other country's bid. Um, oh, here's, here's the Tanglin Neighbourhood Committee, because we, we, of course, engaged with all the locals um, and talking to the local residents. Um, but we didn't only talk to people in Singapore. We had many delegations come from abroad. This was a bunch of Hong Kong school children who came to find out about our World Heritage bid. Um, and then these are some of the ambassadors who head up the delegations from the World Heritage Committee. We took them around um, our museum, um, and they became convinced very early. Uh, the gentleman you see on the far left of the screen is from Finland. And um, it may have sounded like hyperbole, but at the end of the day of showing him around, we took him for dinner. And over dinner, he said, you know, Nigel, today... After the day I got married and the day my son was born has been the best day of my life. What more can you have than that? Anyway, this, this is the auditorium in Bonn um, in July uh, this year where the World Heritage C Committee and all the other delegates were sitting. Um, and this was the moment when we were inscribed. Um, here is um, Minister Lawrence Wong, then Minister for Culture, and uh, on his left, Andrew Toe, our ambassador, receiving the congratulations from the many delegates. And all 21 countries insisted on having the floor and trying to outdo each other in praising the Botanic Gardens, including, of course, the Finnish delegate. Um, so that really brings us to what now? Well, the important thing, I'm, I'm sure, in UNESCO's eyes is that we should continue to educate um, about the Botanic Gardens heritage, which is really coextensive with Singapore's heritage in many ways. We have to be careful to preserve the site 
and to monitor the site because with increased visitation, the site may suffer. You know, people in the heritage world will tell you that there are three stages with heritage. First of all, heritage is not known and needs to be discovered. Then it's discovered and everybody gets excited and then it gets destroyed. We do not want the last of those stages to happen. So it's very important that we, we look after the site and we report regularly um, to the World Heritage Centre in Paris. Um, and any changes that we make to the garden are approved by our stakeholder committee. And we show UNESCO that we have local support for those changes if they're necessary. We have a management plan with nearly 100 actions that have to be taken over different timescales to ensure the preservation of what UNESCO calls outstanding universal value. These are the, the heritage um, ed elements which make it a World Heritage Site. And we will have to revise that plan in five years' time and resubmit. Uh, so that's really um, all I had to say. Thank you for your attention and thank you very much for turning out tonight. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nigel. Now we should open up to the floors if anyone has any question for Dr. Nigel. I'm going to sound really uninformed. Are we the first botanic garden to receive this? We're the second, are we? We're the third. The third, okay. Um, the, the first garden is a tiny garden in Italy, in Padua, which was founded in 1545 and is generally regarded to be the world's oldest botanic garden. It's, I think its, its original core is about 1.6 hectares. It's very, very small. The second garden was the garden I helped inscribe at, at Kew, mm -hmm. which was done in 2003, so we are the third. There are, technically speaking, two other botanic gardens that are within World Heritage Sites but are not World Heritage Sites in themselves. One is Kirstenbosch in South Africa, which is part of the, the Cape Floral Kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's right against Table Mountain, so it has to be included. And the other is the Jardim Botanico Rio de Janeiro, which is included in what's called the Carioca landscape, which is the landscape of, of um, uh, the Organ Mountains from the mountains down to the sea coast. But it's not inscribed in its own right. So we are the third, yes. And we're the only garden um, inscribed as such in the tropics. I was wondering if you found the, the project that you worked on at Kew uh, to get UNESCO recognition to be much different, more difficult, easier than, than the project here in Singapore? Well, that's, a, that, that's another good question. Um, I mean, it was going into the unknown for me because um, the, my director at Kew just said to me one day, oh, uh, we've had a call from the, the ministry. Uh, we're going we're gonna to work to being a World Heritage Site. And I sort of said, what's that? <laughs> um, and there's an interesting backstory there because uh, Britain had just taken the chair of the World Heritage Committee and onto the committee had been voted Spain and the site that the UK was proposing to put forward in the next session was Gibraltar. Now, if you know anything about European geography, you will know that Spain is not very happy that a small part of what he thinks is its territory belongs to the United Kingdom. That is the Rock of Gibraltar. And so um, the government officials looked at this and they said, well, this is never going to work. So we have to cast around for another site that we can quickly work up. Um, as a potential World Heritage Site because for some years UNESCO has had a rule whereby the more developed nations that have lots of sites on the World Heritage list already are only allowed to put up one site each year. So if you miss your opportunity, well, you've missed it. So Q was proposed and then we, we appointed some consultants who've done this before. And in fact, the same consultants who helped Singapore with its bid, Chris Blanford and Associates, I'm not advertising for them, but I know them very well because it's the second time I've worked with them. And um, basically, at Q, the difficulty was a vast amount of information. Whereas Singapore uh, may be important in the Southeast Asian region, it was always dealing with Q. Its master was Q. Whereas Q was dealing with these 100 over other institutions around the world. So it's the depth of content in Q's history is enormous. It's also 100 years older than the Singapore Botanic Gardens and had a royal history as a royal garden for nearly a century. So the real difficulty at the, in the queue bid was to sort out the really, the really key points and produce a dossier which was not so voluminous that no one would bother to read it. We were actually cautioned about putting everything into the dossier because 
the officials told us, if it's too big, they won't read it, and you know your, your key points won't get across. And I actually cautioned our team here on that same point, that we should stick to the, the important facts and, 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 w and weave them into the document rather than just put everything in. Um, so yes, that, that was one of the challenges. But the, the biggest one for me was going into the unknown. I'd not done this before. Coming here and doing it a second time has been much, much easier. Um, some of the things we did in the QBID, which got through, um, we didn't do as well as we've done them here, simply by having the experience of what went before. Thank you very much. Do you have any? Dr. Harrison, um, I wanted to make two comments. Uh, the first is about integrity. Uh, I, I noticed that you rightly pointed out that the paths um, have been left intact. Uh, but, you know, one of the th remarkable things about English landscaping is also uh, the quality of views, that when you walk on the paths, um, they were designed to um, create a series of views which would change. And I think that um, our government, after uh, independence, were a bit overzealous. And they compromised and overplanted with, with that. And um, unfortunately, uh, that I, I think that, that you know, so, some of the plantings are a bit gaudy. Um, when you look at the old postcards, uh, you, 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 you can see the picturesque movement, um, the beauty of that. And um, when you walk, I, I mean, when I was a student at Kew and I visited uh, and looked at the cherry trees that they planted in the 1920s, what I think was quite remarkable was that you could plant plants in the 20th century, but then you would follow the picturesque movements and you would try to adhere to that. And I think that um, it's the, you can still plant plants in Singapore in the Botanic Gardens, but try to um, follow what was the original concept of landscaping at that time. And why it's relevant today is because when you then appreciate the views of the garden today, and that's a concern, of course, because when you then over, over build around the botanic gardens with condominiums, that then ruins some of the effect of the beauty of uh, uh, appreciation you know, uh, around. So I think that, that that's something to consider, you know, the, the concept of views. I think this is something in Singapore which we are not very good at. Well, I, think, yes. I think so I should yeah. deal with the, the second point first, because I think there are two points there. Um, as regards the surroundings of the Botanic Gardens, we are very fortunate that for a good many years, URA, our, our city planners, have had a one kilometer radius area where when viewed from the bandstand, no new building may be, may be visible. And so that really does protect um, the integrity of views because it's a very inward looking site. And, and actually one of the beauties of the Botanic Gardens is that once you're inside, um, once you're sufficiently far away, at least from Holland Road, you don't sense that you're in the city. In fact, when you go to the National Orchid Garden and look out across the valley, it's incredible that you're in a city of five and a half million people. But the city seems to have disappeared completely. It, it's absent. And that's one of the really special qualities of the garden. Um, in addition, we've been planting very tall trees around our boundaries to uh, ensure that that um, isolation as, as a sort of green lung is, is, is maintained. So to your first point, I think there are two things you have to recognize. A garden is a living thing, and when you plant trees, they grow. They get bigger. Uh, but... A landscape is a combination of planted things and other assets and space, open spaces. And one of the big problems with botanic gardens, which are long-lived landscapes, is that successive directors and curators and gardeners always want to plant some more things. And as they plant more things, the available open space shrinks. And one of the biggest challenges is to say no to planting more things. Leave that lawn open. Don't, even though I've got this new rare tree which I want to show off in my garden, leave that lawn open because space is as important as the, 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 the green fabric 
um, around it. And, and so I think that you've made an important point. We, we have to be very careful that we don't fill up the famous open lawns like Lawn E, where the $5 tree is, with, with more trees. Um, there's always a tendency to do that. It's happened at Kew. It happened at Kew in a very severe way. And now uh, at, at Kew, there are, the management plan there says, when this tree dies, you don't replace it because it, you'll get back some open space. Mm -hmm.